Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I am the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the program chair for Streaming Media Connect. This is our seventh virtual event. And uh, that's fitting because we're going to be talking for the next hour about in-person versus virtual versus hybrid events, which is certainly a topic that all of us are pondering right now, whether it's because we're putting on events or attending events. Speaking of in-person events, we will be having our first in-person event in more than two years uh, with Streaming Media East in May, May 24th and 25th in Boston. Uh, registration is open. We've got the website up at streamingmedia.com forward slash east. We'll be putting the program up any day now. We will also be having the Content Delivery Summit on May 23rd, as well as our Streaming Media University workshops. But it's been a great week of virtual panels and discussions here, and we've got another full day of it ahead of us. And then we wrap things up tomorrow with a workshop called The Best Streaming Gear and How to Use It. So if you're on the production side of the things and you, you like your toys, that's definitely one you want to check out. Thanks so much for joining this one. Just for being here, you are entered into a drawing to win an Amazon gift card. We'll be announcing the winner at the end of this hour. I'd like to thank our diamond sponsors, Bird Dog and Harmonic, for helping to make this entire week possible. And we've got a brief video message from each of them right now. And of course, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this panel, NanoCosmos, and Oliver Leeds from NanoCosmos will be joining us in just a few minutes. A couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions for us, please enter them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window. It's easier for me to keep track of questions coming in if they come in there rather than in the chat. Also, we do have subtitles turned on. If you want to turn them off, you can go to Live Transcript at the bottom of your Zoom window, click on that, and then click on Disable Transcript. So. As I said, we're going to be talking about in-person versus virtual versus hybrid events. As we all know, just two years ago, the whole world went virtual. Here at Streaming Media, we had to pivot pretty quickly uh, between March and May of 2020 to get our Streaming Media East event online. And we did so with some success, obviously, since we're still doing those virtual versions of our conferences today. Of course, in-person events began to return slowly last year, but one thing is clear, there's no going back to the way things were before. Uh, event planners, musicians, theaters, sports teams, and, and venues all need to consider that some component of our audience won't be able to attend in person, or now that virtual is an easy to access option, they're not going to want to attend in person. So how do we reach as many people as possible? How do we provide everybody the best experience we can give them, whether they are in the room or watching online? We've got a great group of panelists here today, and they're all coming at this topic from slightly different angles. We have an analyst who's also involved with putting on events. We have a consultant who works with large enterprise clients to help them build their video communications and put on large scale video events. And we have a solutions provider who builds low latency platforms and services for interactive live events. So with that, I'm gonna ask our esteemed panel to turn their cameras on. And uh, I'll just ask you each to introduce yourselves one by one, starting with you, Mindy Sue. Hi, I'm Mindy Sue. I'm the VP of Marketing for Parks Associates, and we are a market research company that specializes in emerging technologies. So that includes connected entertainment, it includes energy management, security, really controlling everything from your home through your mobile device. And with that research, we also host several executive conferences throughout the year, and we have pivoted those to virtual and in person. So we take the time to showcase some of the research that we've been doing throughout the year. 
Excellent. Next up is Andy Howard. I'm Andy Howard, uh, founder and uh, managing director of Howard Associates, which is a consulting company that helps organizations implement video communications. So video streaming, obviously, uh, as well as video conferencing, uh, digital signage, uh, some control room applications are becoming popular because uh, people want to stream those out. So um, happy to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Happy to have you and Oliver Leitz from NanoCosmos. Oliver, how are you doing? Coming to us from Berlin. Exactly. I'm fine and I'm glad to be here. So I'm going to bring up some slides to give a short introduction. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of NanoCosmos and I'm really excited to be here in this session, virtual versus uh, hybrid events and in-person events, virtual and hybrid events are a great topic for us and the streaming industry, obviously. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of NanoCosmos and I'll shortly touch uh, the live streaming workflow and set up for uh, virtual and hybrid events and uh, shortly mention what we do at NanoCosmos. Our product is NanoStream Cloud, which is a global live streaming platform for interactive use cases. and um, that uh, combines the ultra low latency live streaming CDN with a player and an analytics platform for browser-based interactive applications. And um, um, this is uh, available for business integration for 24 seven operation at a global scale. Uh, let me shortly share the uh, live streaming work workflow for interactive uh, events. So you have a presenter on the one hand and um, the presenter is either on stage or in a virtual space, a virtual space can also be joined by other presenters and they are sharing the live event um, to the world uh, with a global audience uh, who wants to access the, this event on any device. And the interactivity is brought to um, the platform by ultra low latency live streaming, which is close to real time to really enable interactive uh, elements like Q and A, like we have here in the Zoom session. So the source can be either a production environment or a web page or a Zoom meeting like we are doing here together. Short example, the uh, um, podium discussion, panel, town hall meeting where you have people on stage and you have Q and A coming in from the audience um, which are bringing up questions and the audience and the, the presenters can directly react to the questions brought up by the audience, um, which could either be text-based or even uh, video-based. That's the short introduction and going back to Eric for the discussion. Very good. So as I said, we've got a range of perspectives here and a range of experiences uh, that'll all provide insight into this topic. We're going to focus primarily on business to business events, conferences like the one we're in right now. Um, and so, so, but we'll ask you to keep in mind, you know, other types of events that are going virtual or have hybrid components, but I think it probably makes sense for us to set the table with some definitions. Now we all know what an in-person event is. Uh, we all know what a virtual event is or can be. But what do we mean by hybrid events? Mindy Sue, can we start with you? Could you give us your thoughts on, on what does it mean to put on a hybrid event or a virtual event that's accessible? So I think hybrid events actually means different things to different people. For instance, for Parks Associates, you know, we turned our in-person conferences, we stretched them out over the year. And so what we're doing is we are still keeping an in-person conference, but then we're adding virtual events separate. So we're not going to stream the live event. We feel like when people are in person, we want them engaged. But when they're virtual, they might not be listening 100% or, you know, maybe they're listening to content on replays. So I think hybrid can be many different things, really depending on the event itself. Good perspective. Andy, your thoughts? I think there's uh, a mini Seuss made a couple of good points there. I think one of the things that you need to just uh, think about is, is it a hybrid presenters or hybrid attendees, right? So for example, in this case, we have, this is obviously hybrid pre presenters because we are nowhere, <laughs> we're located half around, halfway around the world from each other. Um, so, and in this case, it's not a hybrid attendee because everybody's online, right? So in, in, you know, hybrid attendees could be people in person and people remote, either at the same time or not. I did a 
project for a professional services firm recently, and it was for their training. And they came to the same conclusion as Mindy Sue is that if they're doing an in-person training, it's in-person only. And if they're doing, uh, you know, a remote training, it's remote only. There's not really a, a hybrid solution. So I think there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of different applications and a lot of different opportunities for um, how people do things. And I think we'll get into those uh, as we go along here. Yeah, Oliver? Yeah, um, you brought up good points. So I think the hybrid approach can be seen from the production environment and from the distribution environment. So going hybrid in the production side means that uh, you have, for example, panelists sitting on a stage uh, in real life and you have additional panelists coming in to this meeting somehow, uh, which can be by putting a monitor on stage or whatever, and then all bringing it all together in the, to, the, uh, to the live stream. But on the other hand, also expanding your audience. When you are in an um, in-person event, you have a limited audience, whatever, 50 people sitting in the in the room, and you can expand the audience then to the virtual space as well, which makes it fully hybrid then, with additional opportunities for whatever monetization and out outreach for the application. Right, and I think you know all of this starts from the assumption that you look at your business goals first and see what the best way to meet those business goals is. Um, you know, and hybrid events can mean many things. It can mean hybrid production. It can mean hybrid, can mean hybrid audiences, uh, at streaming media. We're going to have our first hybrid event or partially hybrid event with our content delivery summit in May. And the morning is going to be a hybrid audience, but all the speakers will be in the same room. Um, you know, and of course, if we were trying to bring in hybrid speakers, some in the same room and some remote and a remote audience along with the in-person audience that brings with it different technical uh, and business challenges. Uh, let's start by talking about virtual events where nobody's in the same room. None of the speakers are in the same room and none of the attendees are in the same room. And obviously over the last two years, virtual events uh, have been the norm. Can you talk about your experiences with virtual events at your companies or the companies you work with? Have they been successful? Uh, and how do you define a successful virtual event? Um, Andy, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, so I would kind of go back to also the definition of what a virtual event is. I think there's different levels of virtual events. So for example, there's what we're doing here where it's largely, you know, multiple presenters that are doing a video event that's going out to a large number of users with Q&A and chat. Um, there's also sort of the next level of event where it's really like a you know, virtual trade show where, you know, you have booths, you know, exhibit booths that people can go to, you've got networking opportunities, you got prizes, you know, it's kind of a, a multi-part uh, solution that, that goes on maybe for, for multiple days. Um, from my perspective, you know, from, you know, I work most mostly with corporate clients. So for sure, the ability to stream live events, you know, webcasts to uh, internal audiences has been uh, a home run for a lot of organizations throughout the pandemic, especially early on, because there was really no other way to communicate with, with, your, with your audiences. And the audience, uh, because people were so interested in what was happening, the audience sizes went way up compared to what they were sort of pre-pandemic. I used to tell um, clients, you know, expect 10% of your users, even for a you know, CEO broadcast, maybe 20% at a very high bar to be participating. And the numbers, you know, during the pandemic were more like 50, 60, 70% because you had really no excuse not to be there, right? <laughs> you're sitting in your home office and you're not at a client site and you're not, um, you know, you're not out. So, um, so that's, that's been hugely uh, important for me personally, as a consultant, uh, the virtual events have been great to, in order to sort of keep, you know, keep top of mind with, potential customers and things like that. But I really personally miss the in-person interaction and the networking opportunities and all the things that sort of happen outside of maybe the main conference, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, after parties and, you know, things like that, of uh, you know, events and fun social events after. So I'm looking forward to uh, getting back into, into those in 2022 here. And I just want to agree with what Andy said, because the in-person events, the excitement, the energy, it's not just the session content, but everything that happens at an in-person event is 
is really valuable. But virtual events, I feel like there's a new set of goals that you're working towards. You know, you obviously reach a larger audience. You can change things matter of seconds. So if somebody wakes up and they're sick, you can have someone else fill in for them very quickly. That is a lot harder for an in-person event. So with virtual, I feel like it's a lot of educational. Anybody can turn on the stream and maybe do other things, finish their regular workload, check their email, but you're missing some of the engagement that you would get at an in-person event. So I feel like there's different sets of goals. Virtual events are definitely successful. You can bring in people for you know, a shorter amount of time and they don't have to travel and they're still getting the content information. We've tried several different um, online speaker studio platforms and virtual platforms, you know, and I feel like each one keeps getting better and better. So I feel like with virtual events, you have to stay on top of the technology and keep evolving. You don't want to be just stuck in one platform. Mm -hmm. I completely agree that yeah. um, the um, the uh, in-person events is really something we all miss and the informal meetings to have uh, chat, just uh, go to a booth and or meet someone uh, anywhere in, at the venue is really something uh, which makes also the meetings very valuable. But on the other hand, I, I think we only touched the first step for virtual events only. So when we look at the Zoom setup here, it's working really well now, um, but it's kind of... Uh, um, well-known usability for many years. A video conference sitting together on a laptop, that's uh, that's working well. And uh, we also um, enabled our business partners to create virtual meetings and um, cope with the pandemic situation. We just could not uh, do the personal meetings. But I think it won't go back completely to personal and the virtual meetings will, will remain. But uh, in terms of innovation, usability, and all the application setup, I think there's still a lot of room for uh, better applications, uh, better engagement. Um, as Mini was saying, the engagement is missing sometimes in the virtual space, but there, there's room for, for more and to better engage audiences on site and also in, uh, joining remotely. And, and that's a big opportunity, I think, also for all of us in the streaming industry to work on that and provide solutions for this. Right, right. And I think there's something intangible about uh, in-person events, you know, and obviously when it comes to business travel uh, and in-person events, we all need to consider the ROI, but there's an intangible ROI that, you know, for me as editor of Streaming Media Magazine and streamingmedia.com and just a participant in the online video industry, um, you know, I have felt over the last two years, you know, there, I've really missed out on the on the inspiration that comes from going to an in-person event, feeling like you've got a better handle on the trends in the industry, um, and you know, coming back to your desk refreshed, excited again. Um, now, granted, the last two years have been, you know, really difficult in a lot of ways, and haven't had much of that at all. Um, and there's no there's no dollar sign on that sort of value but but it's it's a value that i think is worth paying attention to um you know i'm gonna i'm gonna throw a little bit of a curveball in there already um but you know you talked uh mindy all of you have talked about different platforms different services that allow you to put on events when we looked to pivot to virtual in the spring of 2020 and we looked at some of the platforms that offer virtual trade shows virtual networking we settled on zoom at that point because even in April of 2020, Zoom had become a verb. We knew that everyone was comfortable with it, uh, both from a speaker and an attendee standpoint. And uh, frankly, the video was, compared to the other platforms, the most reliable um, of the ones we tested. Um, and the other thing was that so many of these other virtual event platforms were prohibitively expensive. Um, can you just, the three of you, talk about what have you seen over the last two years in in event platforms becoming more accessible? Have they become cheaper? Have they become easier to use? Uh, Andy, can I start with you on that? I know that wasn't on our list of questions, but I figure let's go there. Yeah, that's fine. I think, um, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of it depends on how much, how much you want to do and how much handholding 
you actually need. So I know a lot of the, the monetary uh, things are, you know, getting the events set up, perfect, you know, their professional services to help the organizations um, put it together. But um, I think, you know, you also have to look at the opportunity cost between how much it costs to do an online event versus how much it costs to do actually something in person, which typically tends to be quite a bit larger. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, you're seeing now Zoom has a, a Zoom events. I haven't um, used that platform yet, but I, I think if they're trying to take you know, what they have here and try to take that to the next level. I think um, Microsoft's doing the same thing with Teams. I'm sure Cisco will do the same thing with WebEx. So I think, you know, some of the larger platforms are starting to think about it where maybe you don't need the whole, you know, the greatest, you know, uh, event platform ever, but you want it to be more than just a live webcast, what's in the middle, you know, something that you're familiar with and something that that's easy to use and relatively easy to set up. So I think you'll see more of that going forward. And our, we had a team that we were looking at different products, like we were doing product demos. I, I, I felt like every other day we were trying to stay on top of what would work. I mean, from our side, our goals are we want the engagement that we were having at in-person events. So we wanted a chat box. We wanted polling. We wanted people to be able to see the attendee list and connect with them, you know, um, be able to download slides or have that trade show capability where people could go and visit sponsor booths. So, you know, we looked at go to webinar, we looked at Zoom, we looked at 24 on, we looked at Hopin. So, you know, I think you just can't stop looking at new softwares because what about if your competitors using something better and greater, or is that going to keep everyone's attention versus what you're doing? So, when it comes to the technology and the software, you know, we use a different platform for our speakers and the engagement that we have. You know, we tried StreamYard um, and a couple of others, and we want something where there's no mistakes. We want something that the technology is going to work. If someone's sharing a video, we want them to be able to see the video clearly. We want them to hear it clearly. You know, we want the transition between presentations to be very smooth because that's what we have at our in-person events. And so we want to replicate that the best way we can with our virtual events. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, and uh, I, I agree the quality of service and quality of experience is very important. So if video quality is low and the whole event doesn't create a unique experience at the viewers, it doesn't uh, really make sense. But it's also, as I mentioned, a starting point. So um, what we learned is that uh, our customers are asking more on an integrated solution, which really um, works in their branded environments, which adds additional features, like you mentioned, also chat polling, uh, even for monetized content like auctioning, uh, you really need some uh, business environment where the video content is directly working with. So there are, it very much depends on the environment you're working with and your uh, uh, business goals. And um, especially monetization of content is um, easier if you have your own branded uh, business environment where your video platform is, is running on. Right, exactly. My, my next... still... Yeah, go, go ahead, sorry. Andy, were you gonna add to that? I uh, know, I'm... Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, my next question was going to be about the the downside of, of virtual events and why everyone is clamoring to return to in person. But I, I think we we touched on that. But I want to focus specifically on hybrid events now. Um, and you know, depending on on what you mean by hybrid, those can prevent present a tremendous challenge to pull off successfully. What are the key elements to making a hybrid event successful, uh, Mindy Sue? Um, so I think you have to understand your stakeholders. In our events, are the sponsors the one paying to have, you know, are they, do they want the in-person experiences, you know, or is the in-person exhibit hall important to them or are they okay with the virtual trade show? How are they getting their lead generation? You know, what connections are they making? Are people really going to see their brand on a virtual event the same way that they're going to see their brand at an in-person event? I don't think so. Our in-person event, when we have somebody that comes in to sponsor a lunch, you know, we have posters everywhere. We have signage everywhere. 
everywhere you look, you're going to see who sponsored that meal. And same thing with our coffee station, you know, an in-person event, you have a casual conversation. Oh, you know, thank you so-and-so for sponsoring. You're not really going to see thank you notes through a virtual platform. So um, I, I think you have to find a good mix to make everybody happy the best you can and still make money doing events at the same time. Making money is a good point. So monetization of the content is important, engagement of the audience. And you can only do that if you provide a good platform, which also creates an experience for the audience as if they were part of that event somehow. So the interaction, the communication between uh, the audience and the presenters is important that you create a unique user experience and high quality for this setup then. Yeah, I think I'm going to go to the example of, which is sort of top of mind right now, the Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl is like the greatest hybrid event that there is. There's people paying $10,000 for a ticket to go actually go be at the event in person. And then there's an enormous um, online audience. They're, you know, traditional TV, but, you know, a lot of online as well people that aren't there that largely are not paying for that and they are able to monetize that in both ways they get people to pay for the tickets and they they you know advertise and covers the uh, the online audience so i think what what's going to have to happen for a lot of these you know conference organizers and i think eric you guys have probably you know had lots of conversations about this is you've gone from an event that was largely we're going to get our revenue from in-person people that are there. So you have to still be able to draw a large enough crowd to make that good. But you've also done a great job of you know, having sponsors for these online events where people are willing to pay to, to sponsor them so you can, you can afford to do that. And there has to be some sort of mix there where you, you might have to you know, diversify your, your revenue stream um, you know, going forward to have that mix of the, the in-person and online not give you so much online that you don't want to go in person, but not, you know, uh, and, and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, you really have to make that in-person experience, uh, unmissable for some people. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously right. the Super Bowl is unmissable for people right. who have $10,000 or more to spare for a ticket, um, to be there in person. But, you know, the other thing that Mindy Sue, I hadn't really thought of until you put it in these terms was, you know, with the in-person event, you have a, you know, you have a captive audience, mm -hmm. everyone attending that event, whether it's a smaller event like streaming media, uh, maybe a medium sized event like the ones that Parks puts on or a huge event like NAB or IBC in our industry, everyone's in a bubble to some degree. You know, it, it may be a small bubble or a big bubble, but everyone is walking the same halls. Everyone is going to the same rooms through the same doors every day. And, um, and you just don't have that with virtual. Uh, you just don't have that for the people who are online. Um, yeah. For an in-person event, I mean, people say, okay, I'm going to be at a conference for three days. You know, don't try to set up meetings on my calendar. And you're away from your workload. You're away from your family life. And you're dedicated to taking advantage of that in-person event, whether that's networking, whether that's setting up in-person meetings for people that are there. And then your inbox becomes secondary. Your workload becomes secondary. But when you're at a virtual event, you're not telling your boss, hey, I'm going to be on this virtual event for five hours. No, your boss expects you to clear your inbox to get meet all your deadlines. And so that in-person event takes you out of your element to focus on the in-person experience. And so I don't think that's really hard to, to duplicate virtually. Yeah, people are making an investment in terms of their time, their travel, their, you know, opportunity cost of going to that virtual event. So they're investing in that event. So they want it to, you know, to pay off. And that's your point. You're, you're totally immersed in it versus the online, which you typically don't pay for. Um, you might not be quite as engaged because, you know, I don't know, I missed this event because I had a call and now. I'm going to watch it on demand, but I never go watch it on demand. I do that all the time, you know, um, you know that type of uh, behavior. But it's interesting, as you mentioned, also these uh, shows where we all meet uh, each other um, also informally. 
I think um, there's also an opportunity which would be there to keep the um, visitors from the virtual space still engaged. So uh, personally, when I think about that, I love traveling to the US and uh, especially to Las Vegas, of course, and it's always great to be there, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. So as last year and probably also in the next couple of years, it would be, wouldn't be every year and many people all around the world, the world can't just travel everywhere. And so if they would be part of that audience somehow and could still be part of this in-person experience by joining the, the sessions uh, on stage, by joining the discussions uh, with the vendors, I think there's uh, there would be room for applications who fill that gap. And on the other hand, as you were mentioning, um, football and uh, uh, these uh, large events, that's also, I think, an opportunity maybe also think about beyond just advertised lean back experience sitting in front of the TV, but add some additional uh, value, like whatever, selling merchandise or whatever things. When you're on a live concert, you can't join, but you would like to be part of that experience. As you know, in a, in a concert, there will be a merchandise sales. You could do that online as well. You could do interaction with the artists, maybe in the breaks. So there's a lot of things which you can think of here, which is um, not going away and uh, which I think is still um, there when more and more um, in-person events coming are coming back. There will be still a lot of room for more valuable virtual additions to that. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that. With hybrid and virtual events, you know, how can we reach a large audience outside the venue um, and keep that audience engaged, uh, the ones that are watching at home or in their offices, and hopefully monetize those audiences as well. Um, thoughts on innovative, interesting, and exciting ways to, to make these things more unmissable for those of us at home, to make someone say, you know, Andy, you, you, you brought up a great point. So often you say, I'll watch that on demand later, and you don't. Um, you know, and I guess this brings up also the whole question about, you know, asking yourself, does it need to be live or not? And, you know, how can you make it unmissable virtually? I suppose content is king, but, uh, you know, any other thoughts uh, about that? And I'll, I'll, I'll start with Andy. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of things that people are trying to do. There's sort of the virtual networking um, you know, situation where it may, maybe it's a sort of a round robin speed date type thing. I'm not a huge fan of that, although I talked to a friend of mine who's in financial services and um, because his whole job is to go out to these conferences and wine and dine people. He's like, at least something for me where I can, you know, make some new, new contacts. But, you know, so if it kind of depends on your environment, I think, because for me, it would be so, I, I have a very, you know, specific client that, that, that I would go after where I, in a lot of these cases, if I did a speed dating type thing, it, it just wouldn't work out. Um, but sometimes they put, they throw you into a room or something like that. Um, there's prizes, you know, the virtual sort of, um, you know, attend all the booths and then, you know, you can get a prize that, that type of thing people are, are doing. Um, you know, I, I think it's all sort of the, the, the stuff that you do in person that, that are, you're now trying to, uh, replicate online. But I, I think to, uh, the point that we were making until you can, uh, somebody said this back in, I think 2000, until you can stream beer uh over the internet you're still going to have in-person sales <laughs> meetings and conferences <laughs> beer, and, beer and coffee right yeah right <laughs> exactly i'm the first one to play those games at in-person events i want to okay. win that prize if it means i go talk to 10 different people to get my passport signed you know it's fun for me and that's <laughs> I think that's the incentive is that you have to find something that is engaging. You know, when I'm at in-person events, I love taking pictures. I love posting with, you know, event hashtags because then people will retweet that or other people will be like, hey, I'm at that event too. So it creates a whole different dynamic. But I think you have to be proactive. You have to be engaging, you know, adding the polling element, adding the, you know, vote for your favorite question to be at the top, you know, you have to, you have to have that engagement. So 
with the virtual networking, we actually did that. We were trying to replicate that casual conversation that happens, you know, when you're getting coffee. And we found that it was this, the same group of people were coming. And so it was great, but we really want even more people to come, you know, with a virtual event, you reach a larger audience. You know, last year, I think we had over 4,000 executives at our event and maybe at our in-person events, that wouldn't be the case, but we want to engage as many people as possible. And so I think you just have to, to keep looking to see what, what's out there. What are other events doing? You can't just say, okay, I'm going to do this because it worked. You have to keep evaluating and keep trying new things to stay, to stay current. Yeah. Exactly, and you need to uh, check, uh, take care about the um, engagement. So you want to keep the people engaged also after the show, right? And right. Um, you need to carefully think about your business model. If you would like to monetize the content uh, by whatever, pay the session, uh, or if you would like to just reach eyeballs in uh, YouTube, which is a very different case, which uh, has um, probably some... Um, not so well side effects if you would, would like to create a, a business out of that, but maybe you can also do both. So you could provide some public content, you could provide some content for a closed environment uh, for an audience who would pay, who maybe gets more engaged in an interactive session where you have real um, real time interaction with a, a real time streaming platform in the background and the right elements on the pages you're sharing, like polling and, and purchasing, whatever during the event so that's all dependent on the business goal and monetization you would like to go but i think it's not either or so you can uh, probably do both you can do a, a good in-person event and add the virtual elements on top of that i think it depends on who uh some of the, the things depend on who your audience is as well so i know um personally i might be dating myself here a little bit but like the whole avatar thing and you know and somebody asked a question about the metaverse and that just doesn't make any sense to me like i don't want to meet with a bunch of people as, as an avatar but the 20 somethings that are coming into the workforce right now are very comfortable with that so you know if it's uh you know to mindy sue she's dealing with executives right they don't really want that they want in-person sort of human interactions whereas you know, some of the, the younger uh, people in the in the workforce might value some other types of interactions. So I, I think, you know, really knowing who, who your audience is depends on some of the things that, that you're going to do to keep them engaged. Somebody else mentioned, you know, games and things like that. And, you know, I think that's great, again, especially for that younger crowd that that's very comfortable with online, you know, games and things like that. Yeah, so the metaverse, I also have some doubts about that, but it's maybe also a, a matter of age and audience. Um, but um, the, in terms of business monetization, it's uh, the question, how can you make money out of that, which doesn't go to Facebook or Meta, <laughs> but uh, creates your own business and keeps right. your um, revenue channel running. Right. Let's let's dig into some of the, we have a bunch of good audience questions, which I, and I want to get to as many as, of those as we can. What are the biggest technical challenges involved in a successful virtual or hybrid event production and distribution? Uh, let's start with Oliver on that, because that's kind of what you do. Yeah, we uh, take care about the distribution and uh, close to real time. If you uh, create a live stream and, and send it out to, the, to an audience, you can ensure that uh, the latency stays very low. So that's uh, a given requirement for interactive applications. Um, to have a robust and uh, scalable network um, to just reach your audience. And on top of that, you, of course, need some um, good setup from, on the production side. So would you like to go web-based, Zoom-based, whatever, um, have a live production environment with a mixing unit or whatever thing on stage? So that's very much de dependent on what you would like to achieve. But there are technical challenges on the whatever network um, distribution side, on the production side. But to keep that under control end to end is important to keep the audience engaged and really um, available in the interactive space. Andy, you do a lot of work on the technical side as well. What have, what have you found the biggest technical challenges to be? Yeah, well, I think obviously, you know, it goes back to the hybrid presenter versus hybrid uh, attendees from the presenter perspective, you need to make sure that 
um, your presenters all have sufficient bandwidth and a good scenario in order to deliver the, you know, their video from wherever they are into, in, in most cases now, sort of a cloud production type environment. And then, you know, distributing it out um, is relatively easy in terms of when you're trying to deliver out to the internet off or internet audience. And then, you know, Nanocosmos and some companies can deliver that at very low latency if you want to be able to have interactivity. So that's a that's a huge consideration there that we just had a talk on on Tuesday about um, you know low, low latency type stuff. Um, from the enterprise perspective, one of the things that I think is going to be um, a big eye opener and can could cause some problems when people start to come back to the office is that you know when they sort of switched to these online events and the audience size got got huge, but everybody was in their home office, you know, they were just calling into Zoom or whatever their webcast platform was, and it was getting delivered by a CDN, and that works all very well. But when you're in an in-office environment, if you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people all accessing that content from the same office, everybody is, you know, like on Zoom, for example, is pulling an independent stream into that office. So none of the sort of ECDN or multicast or, you know, all that infrastructure that people have built over the years to uh, allow for these large scale events is really gonna work in that case. And I think that some people are gonna have some issues when they do have a large audience coming back into the office and have to deal with those sort of internal networking. And also a lot of people changed their, significantly changed their networks over the course of the pandemic to, you know, to allow for some new technologies like SASE and things like that, where pretty much all offices have a direct connection out to the internet, which is very different than the way enterprise networks used to be built. You know, and to add on to what you said, like when we're hosting our virtual events, we have a large number of team members that are in our office. You know, our IT director will be like, okay, everybody, we're going to be doing a live event today. Please stay off streaming, you know, don't stream music, you right. know, we want everything to run as smoothly as possible. And no matter how many boxes we have on our checklist, there's a lot of things that are out of our control. What happens if a speaker is presenting against a window and they're being washed out, even though we did tech rehearsals, you know, we can't help that the sun is coming in at that very moment um, and washing out their face. You know, we want we want to control the bandwidth issues, the, the high quality stream as much as possible. And also virtual and virtual backgrounds. You know, if somebody's, if somebody wants, hey, I want a virtual background, but the lighting is off, maybe it's it doesn't make them the speaker come across as crisp and clear as you would have liked. You know, when somebody's working remotely, you can't control that their cat is jumping through the background and meowing. You know, you can't control kids running back and forth. They get home from school and you're speaking. So from my side, you know, it's less about the technical issues with the software, although we want everything to work as smoothly as possible, but it's also about technical issues of things you you just can't control anymore and I think we're just we're used to it you know we laugh if somebody's kid runs behind them while they're speaking or you know the the trees outside are rustling against the window because everybody is remote these days and so these are issues across the board for everybody you just That's yeah, a good point. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you brought up a, uh, up a funny uh, point with the kids or uh, pets running in the camera because it's it's really enjoyable, isn't it? So it's a lot of fun if you see that. And this makes the virtual meetings really kind of more personal than uh, an in-person meeting which is formal on, the, on a trade show where the family is not there. So uh, why don't uh, use that as a, also an opportunity and just keep it going? So it's not nothing wrong with that to have that nice interruptions in between. And so that's why I mean, you also need to uh, check the, op the opportunities which you still uh, get when you keep that virtual domain somehow active still. I've seen some questions also in the chat that uh, there are some doubts about the hybrid um, event space. So we went from fully personal now to fully virtual. So what happens in the hybrid model? Is there a way to enable that and embrace that? 
And I think so. And, and that's our task as a video industry to make that possible somehow, not only video, but also the whole application needs to be thought of that, that makes value for the, for the audience. And if it's valuable, then uh, of course it makes sense also to build that. And that's the challenges, but also the opportunities we all have, in my opinion. I agree with yeah, everything think, you just said. Um, you know, as much redundancy as you can build into the scenario too is, is really important, you know, especially from bandwidth perspective. So, you know, we usually like to have somebody, if, if somebody is presenting remotely, have their primary and then have some sort of, you know, cellular backup um, in case their, their network goes down or something like that. And there's some things you just can't plan around. I remember, Eric, you like this early, early on, you know, back in the early 2000s, we were, uh, we were doing like one of the first webcasts that we were going to do. It was all going to be awesome. We had planned this out for weeks and uh, lightning struck the building and knocked the power out. <laughs> and so there was like the whole thing went down. We were like, well, that's 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 rough. <laughs> right. But the kind of stuff happens that people are, you know, I think people are much more, you know, especially with the you know the dogs barking and things like that, people are are much more accustomed to that at this point. We we had a we had a virtual event planned a couple of weeks ago, um, and I'm from Texas, and so if you're not familiar with what happened in Texas last year, is that there was an awful winter storm, and you either didn't have electricity, you know, you didn't have internet. It was you had rolling electricity in certain areas. And so it was very scary. And so for that to happen almost a year later to the day, mm -hmm. our team, we had to discuss what we were gonna do. You know, we had a full lineup of, I think 12 speakers and we made the call several days before, look, we're gonna postpone this two weeks. And you know what, it was the best decision that we made, but could we have done that for an in-person event? No, there's so many logistics that go into it, but the safety of our team, you know, we don't want people have feeling ha they have to drive to work. Some people can commute over an hour for a virtual event that was easily trans, you know, easily rescheduled and changed. And it was a very successful reschedule. And so, you know, there, there's lots of advantages for a virtual event. There's lots of advantages for an in-person event. And then hybrid is really a mix of, of both of those. Right. Yeah, we were uh, in the midst of streaming. We were uh, a day or two before streaming media West. I forget the exact year it was five or six years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit and, uh, you know, we lost a quarter of our speakers because they couldn't get out of New York. Um, you know, so uh, obviously those sorts of quote unquote acts of God are beyond our control. But with a virtual event, yeah, you have more ability to be flexible, more ability to push things down the road, to find new speakers. Although for in-person events, I have, you know, I've roamed the hallways to find replacement speakers as well. <laughs> it's a little bit easier when they're, they're virtual. But I, I want to switch to audience questions now. We've got a lot of them. And I think there's one here that's really crucial um, from Ray Harwood. Um, you know, one of the things, if you've been paying attention at all over the last two years that the pandemic has brought up in the public awareness and consciousness is uh, is issues of access, accessibility for those who are disabled, accessibility for those who are immunocompromised, comp uh, chronically ill, who just you know are not physically able to uh, or don't want to take the risk to attend an in-person event. That's an audience that in the past was completely untapped, um, and it's also an audience that unfortunately you know most of us didn't even think about realize that we were leaving out of the equation, right? Um, so, you know, are, do you think that, you know, with these changes that we've seen that organizations are becoming more cognizant of, of the audiences who can't or just, you know, won't attend in-person events and, and are seeing those as a new and necessary customer base? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point bringing that up. And uh, for whatever reasons, people can't or won't travel or join these in-person events. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And we learned in the pandemic, at least, that uh, there was some discussion about these parts of the so society which are more vulnerable in terms of protection and security, safety, etc. So keeping that mindset somewhat active uh, would make a lot of sense. And that's why I... I would also see both ways going forward, not either or, but uh, 
both directions might make sense a lot, not only for these groups, but for everybody who might want to join these events. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the capabilities that are being added to a lot of these platforms are also um, great for people that, you know, might have, you know, other disabilities, like, you know, the closed captioning that you guys are enabling here is great. There's live transcription now. So if somebody, uh, you know, if we were doing this in, in English and English wasn't somebody's native language, um, they can, they could put live transcriptions on and they can change it into their own language. Or even, I know Microsoft Teams, I was just on an event with them the other day. You can actually, if there's a slide deck being presented, you can have the slides be translated into your own language. So there's a lot of those capabilities now that, that make it a lot more accessible for a whole variety of different things. There's audio transcription too for people that are, you know, that are, um, you know, that have problems seeing. So there's, all sorts of really cool stuff that's coming out that, that'll help a lot more people get a lot more value out of these events. And, and for those cases, virtual is, is better. And I agree. I mean, I think the virtual element really helps us reach a larger audience, whether they can't travel, whether they're, you know, need that, that different type of accessibility. And I liked that you had included the closed caption and, so yes, I definitely think the virtual events definitely help with accessibility for many different reasons. And uh, just a little side note, if you are a speaker at an in-person event, use that microphone because there are <laughs> people in the room who can't hear you if you don't use that microphone, <laughs> even though you might think your voice is plenty loud. Um, again, we have a, a number of great uh, questions here. Um, when you're choosing a platform or a method to deliver your virtual events, What's more important to prioritize uh, quality? And I guess that might mean video and audio quality versus ease of use these versus all of the other features a platform might offer. I think it depends on your audience. I mean, if you're, if your audience is that tech savvy people that they don't really care how hard something, how complicated something is, they're going to figure it out in a matter of five seconds. Or is it people that don't have time to click five different buttons, create logins, you know, they want reminders sent to them, ease of use. So I really think you have to take your attendee demographics and review those to really see what works best, because what might work best for this event might not work well for, you know, the connected health industry. So it is, it's very different. But I think quality and ease of use are always important. It is, and I would see quality, not only video quality, but also quality of service and quality of experience, which is really the whole user experience, including um, the usability. So, and then it depends very much on the application. So we have a lot of applications where the video bitrate is not very high, like in uh, auctioning space, for example, where um, our uh, partners need to pay for the, for the uh, traffic, of course, but where it's more important to have a clear audio signal and maybe just a small video, which is one element in, on the web page. You have other types of application where you have live content from on stage music events, where it's more important to have high video quality, so it very much depends on your goals. Yeah, I mean, I, my opinion is it, it's it's the user experience that so somebody put that in the chat too is, is paramount, right? So if the audio and video don't work, then you're kind of shut out from the get go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously it also depends on as a presenter, what you're trying to accomplish, how many bells and whistles you want to, or you can support, right? Like Eric even said, like your team is a small team, so you don't have an army of people to, to do the production of this. Um, so, you know, maybe you'll pull back on a couple of features um, to, to just have the ease of use and be able to do these events, you know, in a, in a back to back to back manner. Um, so, you know, it, it's always a trade off between, you know, the quality and, and, you know, the functionality. Um, and you really need to go and say, you know, like Mindy Sue said, what is, what are your goals for these events and who are you trying to reach? and what do they want? Right, and following up on that, Thomas Galecki has a good question in the Q&A, or maybe it's more of a comment, but I think it's worth exploring. 
you know, it's easy for us in the industry, the streaming, the online video industry to uh, talk about the promise of hybrid events. But it seems like the biggest negative or drawback with hybrid events is that whoever's creating the event almost has to create two events, right? They need staff to put together the face-to-face -to -face and staff to put together the virtual. And maybe it's not realistic for that same staff uh, to put together both. Um, and, and Thomas is wondering if he's alone in thinking that or if, if, that's, if that's something you're considering. I think you, if you're gonna do a live streamed event, with an in-person event, I feel like you need to double your team. You can't just rely on like the hotel AV staff. You want somebody that's familiar with your event that is gonna go the extra steps. I mean, at CES, they recorded our Connection Summit event and they didn't provide the online content right away. So nothing was live streamed. So I think that takes the stress out of it. And then you can have time to edit the content and then add it online for that virtual audience. And they can still, you know, hear the audience questions. They don't have the ability to ask the live questions, but you're still getting some aspect of it. So I think you, you definitely need to double the size of your on-site teams to help you pull off the successful hybrid event in that sense. Also, this depends maybe because uh, as far as I remember, for example, the streaming media shows, there was a camera, camera running, mm -hmm. which was doing a, a production already. So you have someone sitting on the uh, mixer and doing the setup. So for the for the recording, and if you would just send this out to a platform with the right partners who take care about the reliability and the setup, etc., and then could bring in questions that could be whatever, even a Slido deck, uh, which is also an easy to use platform. So you could create some nice stuff maybe together with limited effort, which doesn't require double effort at least. So if you have that setup already, of course, I agree uh, having the right camera and sound and lighting setup is, uh, is a great challenge. But if you have that anyways, then it's uh, maybe not so such a complicated path going forward. Yeah, I, I remember watching, I think it was from the one of these November sessions for streaming media where somebody was saying, when we do a virtual event, we consider it two different events. There's a in-person event and there's a virtual event and we do them complete, you know, together, but, you know, they're considered kind of a separate thing. And they even maybe pull the speaker into the virtual event and do a live Q&A with the speaker, you know, that was up on stage in the, in the, in the in-person event do it um, offline. So that, I thought that was interesting. Well, unfortunately, we are right up against it uh, with the clock and there's more questions. We could keep talking about this for another hour. Thanks so much, Oliver, Mindy, Sue, and Andy for uh, your insights. Thanks to our audience for the great questions. Speaking of the audience, the winner of the Amazon gift card is Colin Campbell. Watch your email for information about that. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, Nano Cosmos, Oliver, thank you so much for sponsoring this panel. And Bird Dog on, and Harmonic will be back in 30 minutes when we talk about niche video services. And we'll play you out with the video messages from Bird Dog and Harmonic. See you in a bit. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.